Here. Welcome to After Effects, Pupil Jordan. Just got it going. All right, so we're going to be using After Effects. We're doing the thing now. It's kind of free for flow or whatever. Um, whatever. We just if anything happens, just edit it afterwards. Like, I'm mm -hmm. All right, starting now. Natural, then, oh, hi. Moving on. So, have yeah. you ever used After Effects before? <laughs> Yeah. And what for? Back in first year, we had a a thing to do. Huh. I needed to, to use it for the animation. Okay. It was a parallax thingy. How did that go? It went well, better than I expected. Oh. Nice. Nice. All right, cool. So, um, what we're doing is just kind of getting the idea of how After Effects works in a general workflow. And there is no real general workflow because every project is going to be specific. You kind of have to do everything um, according to specifications that is necessary and required. And so I'm going to show you some of the things that I know, some of the basic stuff. Uh, I'd always recommend one website. It's videocopilot.net with Andrew Kramer. That's kind of where I started off with After Effects. It's a really helpful website to take note. <clears throat> Okay. So you can head over there because um, I think it's like probably the number one resource for free After Effects education. I mean, there are some things that you're going to need to buy plugins for if you want to do them. But one of the better mm -hmm. things to do is try to find workarounds around things. That way you can say, all right, I can maneuver myself around just the basics. Well, not just the basics, but all right. Mm -hmm. so we might actually touch on so some of the parts I, I like touching on, in, especially when I'm doing like video effects, is um, video editing, and typically you have video editors that do that. You can use HitFilms Express, you can use Adobe Premiere. Um, <clears throat> HitFilms, of course, being the free alternative. Uh, HitFilms Express being the free alternative. Um, or you can just download DaVinci Resolve, which can do that as well. But After Effects is primarily for compositing, which is taking uh, different assets and creating different elements. So for example, if you want to do motion graphics or edit um, live action footage or even to spice up animation, you can actually mm -hmm. use After Effects to do things like those. <clears throat> okay. Right. So typically you start with a new project because, well, well, by default, it's already started with a, a, a project. This one's called Untitled Project. And before you start any After Effects thing, there's two ways you can actually create a project. You can create one from scratch by using a composition, or you can import assets to start building up a composition. But essentially, everything is surrounded, surrounded or in, in, incorporated in a composition. So uh, what I'll do is just start off some new composition. And this part is important. If there's a way to zoom in, I'd show you. Uh, so composition name typically is, what is your composition? Now, in the later versions of um, After Effects, the dialog box is going to look a little different. They're going to have a lot of presets that you can use, and they're also going to have other things. So for example, um, right now you're seeing the last custom size I used. We're working on something called an ambient jig. So I had to use After Effects to pull together something for King's Um Probably I can show you what that looks like uh, afterwards. Mm. Okay. You know, before, so you get an idea of what an After Effects project can look like. So the sizes can vary. I guess most people are used to editing uh, things like HD size, like 1920 by 1080 or any other size that they might get. Or you might get certain projects that require you to use different sizes that are not common. But you find presets there um, in After Effects by default. I guess as time progresses and After Effects evolves and different um, sizes are used in terms of video. Uh, you might see different presets there. But you can also create um, my, you can also create your own custom preset. So for example, I have 460 by 80 and I had used it for an ambient GIF. So let's for example say, please name this preset. And this is typical among a lot of software, not just Adobe products, uh, but other ones. So you did something called ambient GIF. Uh, uh, preset ambient GIF, and it shows you that. Of course, you could have called it ambient GIF. Say, <clears throat> for example, what I do here is call the name of the, the standard size of the video. 
And afterwards, I put the not only the size in terms of height, but also the frame rate that they're using. Mine is actually at 24 frames per second since it was an animation. And there you have also duration. And because I was using this um, method of, um, what do you say, framing, I wanted the frames itself, not the, um, the time code. Uh, right now, because I'm using this particular timing method, which I'll show you how to change, um, it comes up with that last, as in the, the last thing I did. Right, so duration okay. here, it says, 360 frames so and start frame is at zero 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 so you might be wondering hey oh no um you have a clip uh, why would it give you the option of actually changing the start frame um well for example let's say remember earlier when we were talking and we had to do a retake of the start yeah. let's say you have that part and let's say the entire video is played out and you don't want that part of the clip your start frame wouldn't be zero, zero. It would probably start somewhere like after all that messed up part. For yeah. example, when people are recording videos, you have take one, take two, take 53. And what might happen, you might just have the camera stuck in that position. And rather than moving the camera to do all these different takes, it might run one continuous shot and cut off the parts you don't want. So that's why the start frame gives you that. So in the other method of actually doing your time code that I'm going to show you. I'm just going to start this. I'm going to change it to uh, HDTV, let's say 1920 by 1080. So DVC Pro HD. And you can just make sure your settings are there. I don't like this one because it's not 1920. So clearly that was the wrong setting. I might have to use HDTV, which is 1920 by 1080. Okay. Right. So you can just make sure your frame rate is fine. That's 29.97 frames per second, which is for a typical video that appears. On TV, then you have a drop frame, which means after it is uh, 29 point, so 29 frames essentially, close to 30, it's going to drop off that additional padding on the frame. All right, so this tells you it's at 1921st, that that much that that much frame rate. I'm going to press OK. By the way, you can change the way your background color starts off. Now this background color is really just for visibility purposes, it's not so much the actual color of the video because in actuality, your video is transparent. However, when you render and if you have your background as white, it will show as white. But there's different methods of actually putting in a background. For all intents and purposes, I'm gonna this to black because most people are used to starting with the color black. So if I press okay, tada, you're getting this composition. The size specifications are the same. And if, for example, you wanna see uh, I don't know, a ruler. Uh, not talking about Jesus at this moment in time, but we'll all see that ruler one day. If you want to see the ruler, you can go to view and you might choose show rulers. Of course, every, well, almost every option has a shortcut and it's really good to know what your shortcuts are so you can actually improve your workflow. Right now, control R is the shortcut command R if you're using a Mac. And uh, with that, rulers and you can actually see the size of your video of course on the right side you have an info panel which tells you the colors that you are currently viewing whatever alpha they have and where your x and y values are in the cursor just to note your zero zero starts at top left right this is true for most 2d images in 3d it's going to be three um x y and z and the world center is going to be zero 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 for example, right now, you're not seeing a color red by the RGB or alpha. Like I said before, your background is, in reality is essentially transparent. So if you want to see, it, you have an actual transparency, toggle transparency um, here. It's a transparency grid, so I can turn that on or off. But this tells you what is actually happening in real life. Uh, so if, for example, I want to put in an actual background. Uh, we have different types of layers. Now, before we get to the layers, I'm going to change the timing um, timing display. Uh, you can do that by pressing Control on a Windows and clicking on it. It's going to change it to the actual time code that we're used to, which is denoted by zero, semicolon, zero, zero, semicolon, zero, zero, 
Let me call zero, zero. The first set of numbers is hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. Right now, we started with 360 frames per second before, which is at about 30 frames per second. Uh, it's going to be about 360. But you'll notice here, underneath that time, we have 369 between the alternate time, so right here and um, you'll think. Let's get used to, um, for example, some of the elements. One, I'm going to write and create a new, new solid. If, for example, you're familiar with Heat Films Express, they call theirs a new plane. Um, so it's essentially the same thing. It's just a solid color that fills out a space. And you can use it to apply effects to it and add additional things. Right now, the size is 1920 by 1920. That's a full square. But in the event you want your solid to be composition size, you can just hit make comp size. And here you can actually change the color. Right now it's black, which we can just leave and press OK. Now you realize something a little bit different. When I hover over the actual solid, it's going to be in the info bar. R is 0, G is 0, and B is 0 with alpha as 255. Right? Now it's important to show you the different layers because every layer has a certain set of transform um, operations. So for example, we have this solid color, a solid thing. And what I'll do, just to show some additional layers, I'm gonna create a new one. And I usually like starting off with text. So let's say, uh, give me a color, Jordan. Blue. Blue. Oh, welcome back, other Jordan. Is the fact that the two always said blue? That's the... Ah, I don't do drugs. Ah, so let's use blue. Give me a word. Something age appropriate, please. Here comes the laugh. You want the object? Fine. Anything. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Just a word. Rock. Rock. Have any particular font choices? Rock salt, why not? All right, so we have the word rock salt, and we're just exploring the transform properties of each layer. So if we actually expand the layer, and you can see here, these little arrows, you can actually expand. And most layers will have, if not all, will always, will, like I said, most, if not all, we have a transform option here. For other layers such as rock, or if you are using, for example, shape layers or the camera, uh, you're going to have specific um, options for those things. For example, rock has text as well because it is a text. So there's gonna be some text options. Well, the transform properties are typically these. Anchor point, position, scale, rotation, on and up. Capacity. Right, I'm going to tell you what the shortcuts are. Um, for each layer, right, we have anchor point, which essentially is this control center point here that you're seeing right here, or control point, anchor point, pivot point. Depending on the software, it has different names. And you can actually change where that pivot point is. Right now, as I move the pivot point, it's maintaining its position, but it's changing how that anchor point works. But because this is a text, the anchor point can actually be changed also by uh, or paragraph mode. So for example, we typically have, well, in this particular um, option here, uh, our paragraph is right now center text, or center align. If you hit left align, it's going to move the anchor point to another position. Uh, you can also do the same with these, right? Seemingly moved, which means if you're doing anything, and this is why anchor points are important. Take note, um, if you're moving position, it's going to move the position based off where the anchor point is. Right now, looking at the anchor point, you're gonna see 960 by 540. And if I use my cursor and go somewhere there, you're gonna look over at the info um, panel here, and you'll notice that it kind of is very similar to that, 960 by 540. 40, somewhere about there, um, not perfectly with the most, but somewhere there. That's where your anchor point is. Even so, your scale 
you scale from an anchor point, right? So if you do any scaling, it's gonna scale from there. And you can do your rotation from your anchor point, right? This is why your anchor point, again, is important. And also your opacity is the, probably the only option that is not controlled by your anchor point. For example, you guys, the animation, and if you are doing a character, um, which I mentioned earlier, um, rigging a character in uh, After Effects, you would actually do your rigging based on your anchor point. Opacity, however, is the only thing that's not controlled by anchor point. For example, if I choose opacity and I go like so, and it becomes a little less transparent. Uh, a cool thing is when you hover over here, right, you can see the color as well. Right now you're not seeing the opacity, so if I turned off my black and we got the transparent grid involved, right? If I hover over my color, you're seeing the color we have over in the info panel, but you're also seeing that there's an opacity of about 87%, or not 87%, 87 out of 255, right? Um, so that's one way that colors are done. Uh, you have the RGB settings, sometimes you have the HSB, HFL, um, and others, right? So that's something that your info panel can tell you, which to be honest, I've never really used the info panel, but just knowing that that is there is good to know if, for example, you have a specific color you want um, and you want to identify exactly which color it is, you can actually do that. Or just use the eyedropper tool that is provided by almost any uh, panel or any property that uses colors. For example, here, you want a particular color, right? Even colors outside of your, you know, your space here in your canvas. You can actually pick colors. If you, for example, want to pick colors from even your interface down here, your Windows interface, or if you're using a Mac, like I said, you can actually do the same. All right, so let's actually get some work done, some animations doing. Um, haha, lol, doing. So, uh, background is there, uh, and we want to play with. For example, this. Let's say you want rock to move on the screen. And I want to, to tell you what the, for example, the, the shortcuts are. It's good to know the shortcuts, especially for your control, your, your transformation option. I'm going to explore that. Let's do that. So right now you're seeing A, P, S, R, O. So here's how it works. Uh, and this is like a little acronym you can use to remember. You have P, which controls position, so you're going to see them appearing. Uh, A, which is for the anchor point. R, which is for rotation. Opacity, actually the shortcut isn't O, but actually T. Opacity, you could always use that as a thing, or you can think of transparency. And the last one is S for scale. So P, A, R, T, S, P for position, R for rotation. Oh, I said P for position, A for anchor point, R for rotation, T for passive P, and it's for scale. But in the event you want to have more than one of the options up, and you don't necessarily want to see everything all at once, you can select one. So for example, let's say we have position P, and you want to add to the position, add another property. You can hold shift. And for example, let's say position and capacity. I'm holding shift while pressing T uh, and it adds to that. If you want to take off one, for example, I want to take off position, even though we're seeing now, I hold shift and press P. It's almost like you're toggling it on and off. Right, so P for position, you know, P again. So you can toggle it on or do. So if you press one at a time, they're only going to come up one at a time. If you want to add to them, you hold shift and you can get additional things on there. Yeah. Right now we're seeing rock boring and we haven't done anything yet. So this tutorial so far is a bunch of me talking about things and not actually getting things done. So let's do rock. Let's see you have rock. What we're gonna do is have rock come on screen. Now uh, when I started using After Effects, I didn't quite understand how they got things to do work, but I'm more of a person who would um, explore and try to figure out how things work. One of the things I was used to is like, for example, I used to use Adobe Flash. At the time it was Macromedia Flash or 
we will touch now any adult with anime. And you think that, hey, use a time indicator, and just because something's there and you want to move the position, you probably might think to yourself, all right, cool. So maybe I start a position here, move it about here, and then change the position in there. And you probably think, okay, an animation is supposed to happen now. That's not how it works. Uh, perhaps you weren't noticing, but beside each uh, property, so P A R P S, P A. RPS, besides each property, you have what we call a time very slot, which essentially allows you to animate that property. Everything in After Effects that has a time indicator is animatable. That includes text as well. So, uh, for example, we're going to move this from left to right just to start off. Very basic. But we're going to move, and if you're moving something from left to right, think of it as position. Now, wherever you want the animation to start, that's where you put your time indicator. So for example, if I want to start after two seconds, I move my time indicator to about here. And you can choose to go forward or backward, uh, let's say for about one second or so. We're going to have this thing move across like so. And if you know the principles of animation any at all, you can actually do a thing where it goes forward, perhaps comes back a little bit, and you know, settles back into that position. So you notice that every time I move this, you're getting a little bit of a, um, you're getting another keyframe added. So every time you want, every time you move something that is, if you turn on the animation and turn on the time very stopwatch, you can. So every time you make a move with it, it's going to animate. If we play this out, at zero frames, it's going to be doing nothing, 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 nothing until two frames. And look closely. When it hits that keyframe, you'll know over here. There's a little thing that tells you what kind of key. There's a keyframe there. I don't remove keyframe. So for example, if I play this out, and we usually have to, you can actually kind of scrub this. This is what we call scrubbing. And it goes up forward or backward, forward or backward. So it kind of settles. And perhaps maybe you want more of a setting. So I can say, all right, you just something very subtle. Right, so bam, da, 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 da. right, rock. That's pretty cool. Right, so you have the animation going on. It's nice, it's very smooth, it does its thing. That's just for positioning. Right, so for example, what what, what other effect do you think we could add to this? Let's say you want it to kind of fade in while it's coming. So it's going to be fully transparent at the beginning. And then as it begins to go to the first part, it's going to do a thing where it does a, it just comes really thick. So, for example, that property would be our opacity. So, right now, our opacity is 100%. Now, if, for example, you, you can actually start at any percentage you want. So for example, you want to start at zero, but let's say I want to make sure that, hey, at this point, it's supposed to be a hundred. I want to drop my time very stopwatch there and I'm going to pull this back. Now, let's say you want to be exactly at this particular point. And let's say your hands are kind of shaky. So you're like, oh no, I have trouble sticking to this particular keyframe. What you can do is holding shift snaps to the keyframe right there. And I'm going to have this opacity start at zero. So I'm pulling back the actual property to zero. And maybe you actually definitely want it to start at zero, perhaps here. What you can do is just move your time indicator somewhere else and just hold shift to snap. So it starts off like that. And it's, yeah. For example, let's say you want to start off like this. And when it hits one side, right? So yeah, we start off here, here. Maybe you want to start off there and then perhaps for a little while it comes on. It's not fully there yet, but you want it to be very dull, still very dull. But when it hits here, bam, maybe after it hits that wall right there, so it's almost like when it hits the furthest position, which will be here, you want it to become a hundred percent. Right? And you don't want to be gradual, you want to be immediate. So what happened, what you can do is this. There's two ways you could do this. One, 
you could use a different type of keyframe because there are a, a few types of keyframes. One is a linear keyframe. Another one is a Bezier keyframe. And then you have what we call a hold keyframe. I'm going to show you how these work. Uh, what a linear keyframe looks like, and the reason they call it linear is because animation like this works on a timeline, which means you're going to have a property, and that property is changing over time. What a linear keyframe looks like, it's a very, it's basically a straight line going from one state to the next one. I want to show you something that usually I don't cover on the first day, uh, which would be a graph editor. Kind of shows you how this works. Right now we have here anchor point. Right, don't worry about, right now we're looking at position. And right here we're seeing position over time. But right here, it's basically, I don't know why this is 3000. I'm going to change the way this looks. But let's say we have that. That tells you that much pixels per second. And afterwards, you have this. Right here, it drops. Why is it like this? Give me, give me two minutes, I'll be back. I have something to do. Fine. Let's play with capacity instead. Take us to that one. Show. Show animated properties. I'm gonna hide. I don't wanna see this one. I wanna see. I wanna see the right one. Is this one? So you have both positioning and you have also opacity. You can see opacity here. The highest uh, property for opacity is 100%. So think of these as values. If I was to zoom in, oh, can I just click on this and auto zoom in graph? No. Can I, can I not zoom in? Oh my. I would definitely love to zoom in. It's like I don't have that ability. <laughs> yeah. Because I want to show you what the linear keyframe looks like. All right, let's look and change the, the view of stuff. Okay, so we have fit to all graphs, fit selection to view. I really just want this part here, just here. That and this. All right, looks like I just have to work with that. Oops. Right, so essentially, we have this here starting at zero, and the graph is going up. The reason why this looks like this is because of our positioning. It's taking on some very high values per second and then slowing the, the frames per second down there. So right, just looking at this only, and if I could just even hide or delete this positioning would have been probably easier to understand. But you have it going from zero to 30%. And then from 30%, it's going to 100%. Like I said, it's really difficult to see because zero to 3,000, it's just doing one particular value. Once On position, we can actually change X and Y values. Right now we're seeing this, and this is what looks like a spline. So it's essentially taking on some values here. We could actually change this to a regular linear keyframe by actually selecting that keyframe, right clicking on it, change the keyframe interpolation from continuous Bezier to linear, and it's going to be very, very stiff. So this is what the linear keyframe looks like. It goes from point in a straight line and then continues over. Again, it usually tries to do a straight line with the linear one. You can always right click and just change that time keyframe interpolation to linear. By default, After Effects tries to smooth out your animation, but I'm just trying to show you the example of a linear keyframe, which is essentially when everything here obeys the will of the uh, I'm actually going to have to split them one by one to change the keyframe. Insert keyframe and linear. Right, but that kind of shows you an, an idea of how things look in a graph. 
Besides that, it looks very much like this. So I could, you know, select the whole thing and just say, uh, well, let's just make the whole thing linear, you know? Press OK, everything becomes straight, everything becomes stiff, and we have something looking like that. And the reason why we're seeing the X and Y position is because I made a split in the graph editor to show those things. I actually wouldn't usually do that. You could just make it an X and Y value thing here. But this splitting of it actually can become useful in some way. For example, back to the little drawing board. Hopefully I haven't confused you yet. But right now we're just doing a thing and I'm just gonna zoom out what I have here. It comes in low opacity. It gradually becomes 30%, like we had 47% about here. 30% here, and then from here to here becomes 100% because of this transition between 30 to 100. It's going to use the time it has to do a transition uh, in a linear way. All right, but if you wanted this to, for example, snap on the dot as soon as it hits that furthest point. Like I said, there's two ways you could do it. One, lower the amount of keyframes between them. So for example, you get a bam like that. There's no in-betweens, right? There's no tweening happening. So there's no, not going to be any transition because the keyframes are too close. It's almost like if you have a one-year-old and a 10-year-old, and there's a 10-year span, you're going to see some natural growth occurring. But if, for example, you let a one-year-old become a 10-year-old in one year, you're going to have a very quick transition, right? Or even better yet, uh, a baby becoming a 10-year-old in a day. The closer you put the keyframes, the, the faster the transition, right? The reason why I said you can do this two ways, one is by putting the keyframes close together. The other one, which I'm going to show you now, is and I'm going to be playing with opacity. I'm going to delete this. I can insert a keyframe here, and the type of keyframe I'm going to use this time, I'm going to right click. I'm going to probably change it to a very low keyframe, so 21. Right click, uh, keyframe interpolation, and from linear, we're going to change it to a whole keyframe. Of course, there are two ways you can create a whole keyframe. You can just choose toggle hold keyframe from here and it will toggle a hold keyframe. What the hold keyframe does, it creates what we call step animation, which means it's not going to transition from one state to the next state. It's just going to change states immediately. For example, we could start off here with a hold keyframe and just change it to like a hundred. Well, not, not, not this one. Hmm. Right, so we want a hundred on. As soon as it hits that wall right there, <clears throat> just move that. Yeah, it's there. When this does that thing at the furthest point here, you could say, all right, care back to a lower one. Or in fact, go from bam to this. And when it hits this side, it's going to lower the opacity. All right, so let's say it does that comes over here, goes that, it's brighter, comes over here, becomes taller, comes back over here to settle and becomes brighter again. Then when you're playing that out, now you notice as I'm moving this, there's a little green area here. This is you caching your frames, which means you're loading up those frames into memory, so when you're playing it back, right, it knows what to do. Because here it doesn't do anything. From here to here, it does nothing. From here to here, it's basically at a standstill, so it's not going to do anything. So there's less space to worry about. Because that green part has loaded, when I press play, even though I'm at full resolution, which you can actually change, press play, and it'll play out naturally. Bam, bam. So there we have very simple animation. I probably over explained it, um, but hopefully that, that helps a little bit. Do you have any uh, suggestions as to what I could possibly do next? Or you like to see if you have any, uh, what's the word? Like requests. 
If he's still there, that is. If he's not, I'll just continue to do something else. Motion blur. All right, lovely. Love that idea. So motion blur. All right, so how do you do motion blur in this? Well, After Effects has multiple ways of doing motion blur. One of the things to get motion blur happening is you have to turn on automatic motion blur. So here we have something that says enable motion blur for all layers. Note with the motion blur switch set. If I turn this on, you almost expect motion blur to happen immediately, but it doesn't. The reason why is because we haven't actually turned on toggle switch for motion blur. And right now you're probably looking at this and you're like, I don't see any toggle switches. Well, there's a little button down here that says toggle, toggle switches slash mode. So you can actually click on that and it bring up one of these things is the motion blur which simulates shatter, I mean stutter duration. <laughs> The other ones you can use to do things like adjustment layers and 3D layers. They actually put things in three dimensions. Because I have this on, I need to also have this on at the same time. Because if you don't, it's not going to work either. So for example, uh, we have this and right now the opacity is very low. So perhaps I'll start off in a brighter opacity so you can see the motion blur. And note, you have to have both this and this on. If you have this on, if you have this one, but don't have that one, it's gonna still be like that. If you turn on this one on, both of them on, it's gonna be like that. If you turn off this one, it's going to be like that. So you have to have both of them on for both layers. So this is for all layers, but then each individual layer has, has to have the motion blur right up there, which allows you to do that. And I guess you mentioned motion blur because of what we were doing earlier today, which was which we wanted to do like a fast paced background. Right, so this is one of the ways you can actually do it. Um, but this probably wouldn't be the best way I'd suggest. And also, if you are doing a motion blur per se like this, and let's play that over again. By the way, I'm going to show you how to play over just a specific part of your animation again. So you have here the work area start, and you also have the work area end, right? So one of the things you can do is change your work area start and change your work area in by pulling these closer to where you want to isolate the animation that you're doing. Now, you'll see me do this manually, but there is also a shortcut for that. You want the beginning part to be where your time indicator is, you press B. If you want the end part to do the same, end. So end for the end and B for beginning, which controls which parts of the animation gets rendered out. And at zero just now, right? So it starts off there. I don't know why it went off. I was to do the thing here, just one more loop. And I hope it would loop. Then I would do a thing. Well, I don't know why it's not doing the thing. So give you option. Point time. Right, usually it, it works. If it doesn't, chances are I did something wrong. Typically it would work. I'm, I'm not sure why. Right, so you also have full screen mode. If you want to play out things, you can do full screen at right time and do things like ping pong it. Right. You can zoom in, zoom out. That gives you options over here. The shortcut to play out your uh, animation is zero on the numpad, or you can just simply hit the this one here, the RAM preview button. Right, next frame is there, play. And you can actually just load up your frames, and there's a button, RAM preview, which allows you to essentially preview whatever has loaded into RAM. I want to change back these to where they were before, and just so else. Now let's do another composition. So this is just basic stuff here, bam, motion blur. So this is composition one, we can always just right click on it, rename it, and say, ah, basic. Basic, very basic. In fact, it's so basic, I'll call it zero, zero, basic, right? So there's another thing I want to show you before I move on. Perhaps you want to be able to change your anchor point Right, so for example, you've done an animation, you realize, all right, maybe the anchor point shouldn't have been there. 
you can actually manually change your anchor point rather than actually using the anchor point thing, which actually does the offset, which may not be something you want to do, right? Because that pushes off. You can actually use what we call a pan behind tool, it allows you to change the offset of something. So, for example, let me do an animation that has a bit of rotation in there to make it more effective. I'm going to turn on rotation and say, for example, this thing is coming in. I kind of want it to seem like, oh my gosh, this thing is fast, you know, and stuff. So I'm going to go here, rotation. You can actually rotate using this, right? Or you can actually use what we call the rotate tool, which is basically coming here. That's a tool up there, rotate. Sure, what some people in some books will say the rotate tool, which is W, rotate. Okay, just remember the shortcut. Also makes it sound a little bit silly, but that's cool as well. Bam, with rotate that a little bit. And as it's coming, you know, you're gonna have that, oh yeah, wheelie kind of a thing. Right, so wheelie in, maybe you want to go back a little bit. And then afterwards, bam. You want that follow through. So it's gonna go from here. and almost like a bam kind of a thing you want this to be zero 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 right while it does that thing so earth boom and so what if you wanted it to do a rotation at the back end there bam as it goes this way maybe it lifts up from the k part okay so bam What if you want to change the anchor point, right? What if you want to do something? What I could do is I have my anchor point here. I'm going to turn this anchor point into a hold keyframe. Remember we're talking about hold keyframes where you can jump from one state to the next one. I'm going to do that for this one. I'm going to have my anchor point like this at first initially. This is normal. But then as it comes over here, I'm going to use, we call it the pan behind tool, which is here. Oh, wait, oops. This one panning behind tool. I'm going to change my anchor point, which you can have to be careful of because the anchor point does take um, your stuff from your positioning. Right? So you will see that happening there. Oh, sorry. You can use your X and Y values to do stuff. Right? So Knowing what that's going to look like, you can probably change your positioning, position, positioning of whatever it is you were doing before to where this thing goes. Oh, this is breaking everything. Perhaps not the best thing to do. What I can do, however, I don't want to be preemptive, but we could actually have something else control the rotation on the other side, which kind of feels preemptive. But let's do that. We're going to create a parent child relationship. I didn't really want to touch on this yet. But because I already said I wanted to do that, I'm going to try and commit to doing that. So I'm going to create a null object. And a null object has its center at the top left, usually. And I can use that top left to do that. The thing I want to do is make this rock a child of said null object. I'm going to go like this and click on that. So it now tells you the parent of rock is now this null object, which means if I wanted to do exactly what I said I wanted to do a while, which is where I have rock do this, right? And then we want to rotate again, kind of the way we had it there before, right? What happens when you have a parent child relationship? The child can go anywhere the child desires, but when the parent is ready to move, the child kind of has to just follow, right? For this null object, I'm going to use rotation. I'm going to set my keyframe there. And because I want this thing to do things, it's going to have it do rotation thing like this. Let's see if it works, actually. So this is purely experimental. So one keyframe there and do a rotation. 
and rotate this thing is going to be like this. But you can see what the problem is, right? Because you rotated the positioning. So when it comes to parenting, positioning changes, um, location changes, even your scaling can change. So that's one of the things that you can have to be mindful of when it comes to doing your rotation like that. And there's ways to circumvent that, but as you can see, it's not exactly the easiest process for me right now. Being that I just want to cover something basically without confusing you. Okay. And the other way would be to kind of manually do this and kind of play with the positioning on this and say, okay, positioning is like that, huh? All right, so when you do your thing like this, right, we're going to have to, right, so that just there. Let's say you wanted to make sure it follows, you know, initially where it was going to go in the first place. Bam. Right. So you want positioning to change. Positioning P. Right. What you could actually do is just move this down like so. Two controls gonna happen. So be like bam. Yeah. Right. And then afterwards, because I'm saying I'm committing, right? Rough. <laughs> It's almost like when I'm animating in 3D, to be honest. You can't just have the controls there, just so things would work. But like I said, this is a little bit more tricky than it is. To be honest, when you do stuff like this and you get it to work, it's kind of like one of the most satisfying feelings. But then part of it is like bittersweet because your client doesn't really care about how you got it done as long as you get it done. And I guess that's why the disparity between um, clients and designers or creators is that um, sometimes clients don't actually know the entire process or what it takes to get the job done and so they sometimes undervalue um, the artist's work which I find frustrating at times right so there's that so I'm going to leave this part alone because I know what I'm getting myself into and I don't really think we have all the time in the world for that so going to be something else, um, new composition again. So same thing, uh, this time I'm gonna do like a very basic title intro, right? We're gonna be using some effects, just starting off with a, a few a little, thing, little things from here and there. All right, so I'm not sure if you were there for this part, but here we're just gonna create about, about five seconds intro. So the first part again, zero, zero, refers to your hours, minutes, seconds and frames, right? So that tells you how long your um, duration is. Always good to pay attention to how the start time code relates to the duration. Because if, for example, you have something that starts not at zero, 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 but at, for example, six seconds, and the duration is 12 seconds, the length of your entire thing is going to be six seconds long because of the closeness of the start to the end. So you might, again, as a refresher, you might wonder why would you give somebody the option of having a start time code and not just sticking with the zero, zero, zero. As I said before, imagine if you had a, a, a continuous shot footage and the first 10 minutes were um, messed up. You'd want to be able to just start after the 10 minutes, so then it, the time code would start at 10.01, 10 if you want to say that, and then the duration will be as long as you want. So uh, we're going to do something here. I'm going to change my background color to something uh, a little more skin tone. So I have this. And we're going to add a few effects. One, I'm going to start off adding a solid, which again is a shape. And if, for example, you had your composition size sitting at before and you want to make it the composition, your, sorry, your solid size, and you want to make it the same composition that you have here, just make inside it's going to work out. I'm pressing OK. We're going to get a black solid. And the thing about it is that when you create solid, there's a folder here. There's a solid folder for solid. So sometimes you might have a black solid, and you're like, oh, well, I have a black solid, and you have another black solid. Uh, one of the things is that every time you create a new solid, regardless of the color, 
um, it's going to drop it inside the solid hole. Even your null object at solid, they just render a little differently. Right, so if, for example, I have a black solid two and I've already used a solid which is exactly the same size, me using this again is not going to kill me. Right, it's better to just reuse assets that you, you know you can reuse rather than not. One of the things is that, however, your in and my internet is unstable. Are you still there, Sam? We are still here, Jay. Well, yes, I, I am, sir. But I'm still here. Rough. Let's create a very simple title intro. One of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to look for some smoke effect, like you know, some very subtle smoky effect. Just going to pop on opera for a second. My mind is your tabs that I feel so left out. All right, so if people can find some, <clears throat> oh, I think I know why I know. Turn off this VPN foolishness. Um, smoke effect. Hmm. Video. Right. So let's see if we can find any free footage. Vidizi has a lot of free footage. So I'm going to show you some effects you can actually create using After Effects. And it's primarily called After Effects because you layer effects on effect, create effect. Right. So just the notes for future reference. The way you stack your effects does matter. It's almost like pushing it through a pipeline. One thing affects something, that affects another thing. Why is it still there? Yeah, stop. Give me, give me internet. Right, we have a few things here. Um, if I can find one that works. This one says pop ring and stuff. All right, let's say, this one. And because it's 20 seconds long, this is actually pretty good. <clears throat> Download and begin automatically in now. Right, so smoke is there. So I guess you can look at videos if you want some stuff. You know, it's going through as well. Uh, you can probably check their stuff if you want stuff. You can also look at Pixels. Pixels also has things. So you can always do things with that. So if the thing has done downloaded, right? So for example, it's in a folder for the downloads. For now, I'm going to keep it in the downloads folder, but essentially when you're working on a project, try to keep everything that you're working on in the same folder. I'm not sure if the new After Effects now allows you to save all your objects into one folder, which would be kind of cool that way it would isolate um, any problems that you might have later on, which is when you move something, you don't want to be losing stuff. So for example, recent places, uh, so many recent places. Um, smoke, right, so we're going to look at two, a few things here. Um, one is blending modes. So I'm creating a very subtle, so let's look at our footage. You can actually double click on your be able to play them out. So, you know, if you hit space bar, it usually plays the clip and you get to see what the clip looks like. So the smoke looks, it's in slow motion. So um, that's cool and all. I'm also gonna download something else. I wanna probably go on YouTube and from the YouTube audio library, just get uh, a clip. You can also go on, uh, so what's that used to be in Compitex? In Compitex. Right. In Compitex is another website you can actually get royalty free music for free. This is by Kevin McLeod, um, which is an American composer, as you can see on the right. So he produced his music and has decided to give it away for free. You can also find some of his um, music on the YouTube audio library. For example, modern cinematic, uh, I'll click on it and add, and we'll close that. So royalty free music, I'm not sure if this is an ad, but it's supposed to work. So yeah, Then also preview his music as well and has some weird looking things. So let's say impact preview, let's 
Play. I don't like it. Thank you. So, definitely not. All right, so I am looking for something more on the violin side or what's the word? Film music, huh? Where's the search bar? You can actually buy his music now. Nice. All right, silent film mystery. Here we go. Mystery probably will be the best to take it. I am not seeing. Okay. And this is the latest stuff. I want to see the ones that are. Nope. Hmm, cute. Yes, this works. All right, so let's just download this one. Kudos to you, Mr. Uh, so you get the idea what you can use it. You can actually use it commercially for free. That's cool. But you can't do it without attribution. So, I mean, that's, we're not going to be doing anything fancy. Um, please authenticate. Oh, boy. You know what? No disrespect, Mr. Kevin. I love your work. But at the present moment, I need to go on YouTube audio library. I feel like I might find something very similar there. So YouTube audio library is a place that you can actually get content uh, for free uh, on YouTube, clearly. So for example, no, go away. Um, no, what? No. So let's search mood, perhaps. Uh, we want dark and dramatic or sad. We're making a title. I mean, it has, uh, here we go, piano trap with Beethoven. You, that's awful. No, are we? Sometimes I just feel away, but not today. Hear the bars, Jake. Definitely not. The bars. Smoky eye. Hmm. No, not quite. How is that the pattern of sadness? All right, let's look at 19th floor. Yeah, I'm just not capturing what I want to do yet, guys. Come on. Violin. Yeah, let's look for a violin. Ooh, leaning on the everlasting arms. Let's hear you. Nope, love the song, but it wouldn't fit here. Cinematic with a rose in teeth. Yes, this, this could work. Yes, yes, quite right, quite right. With a rose in your teeth. All right, cool. We're also downloading audio. So that's one. So we've done the smoke. We've gotten no audio, which will be solo cello passion by Maxwell Media Rights Productions. I'm guessing that's. So you can actually import, like I said, your clips in here. So we have one footage smoke. Remember, we only have right now basic title intro. We didn't even check how big this is, but it says 1920 by 1080, which fits. So I'm going to hide my ruler for one. I don't really need to see it, to be honest. So that's Control R or Command R if you're on a Mac. I'm going to throw this in there, smoke. And if you just drop it inside your, you know, layers here, your layers and your timeline thing, what happens is that it centers it automatically. Of course, you can do the same thing if you uh, drag it and it's going to try and snap to center by default. Um, so you can always just do that as well. And if you just pull this, it comes up with all that beautiful stuff. 
All right, so I want a title. Give me something. Um, I'm going to make use black this time. I want a text. I want um, I want something that would work. Um, um, So I've had all of his wings. I'm going to take off the stroke as well because I don't want to end up in the hospital. So change that rock thought to something else. By the way, I think newer After Effects give us a better way to view the fonts. Let's change those stroke and nothing. Be gone with you and your nothingness. Shadow of his wings. Rock and typo. I'm not quite fit in the mood. Oh, Paul Mall. Yeah, this works. Shadow of his wings. We're not going to really do anything with it that works. We're going to add the effect to it. Uh, so shadow of his wings is there. We want this to be in black, and you might ask yourself, uh, why use black? Uh, we're not going to see it. All right, so we have that. We have this in there as well, shadow of his wings. That looks kind of cool, doesn't it? Now, here's the thing. It works right now because we have a contrast between black and white. But what if you want to put in another clip? Let's say you want to do something else with it. What if you want to use this clip, this shadow of his wing text, and you want to use this image here, or this video, sorry, as a mask? Now, remember, when it comes to masking in, for example, particularly Adobe products, white is going to be the thing that shows it, and black is the thing that makes it look like it's hidden. So because this video is already black and white, it's very, very easy for us to do things. All right, so we have shadow of his wings. And what I'm gonna do is we're going to use this thing, this, this, this smoky effect as a um, map. But one thing you can do is put the smoke effect over the text. I want to toggle the switches again. Now there's two ways you can do this one. I mean, you could always just toggle switches and change your blending modes to do something else like, I don't know, screen, Perhaps multiply might work, I'm not sure, depending, or perhaps uh, darken, no, not darken. The thing is, you can have to play around with these to get it to work the way you want to. Well, I mean, it's very difficult to do a, what's the word? Very difficult to do a overlay using something on a black background. So that'd be easier if you use that different background. So this is not working out for me. This, however, can work. So right now, we're going to be using a track map. Like I said, uses um, an object, either pixel data or um, opacity data or lum luminosity, or, which is the black and white, to do a mask on the, um, the, the, the layer below it. And it's always the layer directly below it. So for example, you want to create a nice cool title thing. You'll see here on shadow of his wings uh, and track mask, click on that. And change that. So there's two options we have. We have alpha mat. And if I change this to alpha mat, what's going to happen? Well, if I change the font, you probably see it shows up um, clearly. The reason why it shows up clearly is because, not because um, the image is white right now, but really because if we were to move this, it's based on pixel data. So the mere fact that the video exists and has pixels. Is what it's using to mask it or show it in this particular case. The other way, however, is not just alpha, but we have inverted alpha. Alpha inverted is flipped, it, which means as long as there's pixel data, it's going to not show. So if I hide it or move it, it's going to show. The better one in this particular case, because we're using black and white, is using the Luma map, which is the one that controls black and white. So we do that right there. Um, what you're going to begin to you know, is that smoky thing. I'm not sure if you can see it. I was just zooming a little bit. Um, as this thing plays out, right? Right, you're gonna see that it's a very subtle thing. Very, very, you know, I can't see anything. Right, so what I'll do. I'm going to change this to black and white. 
so that we can actually see what it looks like in black. Right? And perhaps you're wondering why we can't see it. It's because of this. This is what's happening with the same video. Smoke is passing by, or if you were to make this font a little bit thicker, or quite a bit thicker. Yo. Oops. Laura, nope. You're not picking that one, Jordan. Stop it. Bandwidth, Bebas. Yes, Bebas, and we make Bebas a little bit bigger. This is what's happening right now. It's actually playing out the thing and it's using the smoke as a mask, right? And this would be really cool. This could work for, for example, you're creating a film mystery perhaps, and you want this lovely transition for it. So you basically have made a lovely transition and you barely put in any work. After this, just doing the work for you. Now, the problem is, let's say you wanted the black background, and you wanted the white smoke. The issue is we're using the smoke currently as a layer. Uh, what do you think we can do to, to change that? Put on your thinking cap. So one is being used as a smoke, but we also want the smoke to be the background for this entire effect. Of growth. Your time has elapsed. We would duplicate this. So duplicate, you press Control D, create a copy for you because none of that fancy Luma Mac thing. You can click and drag it down underneath your stuff. So when it plays out now, right now you're not seeing it because currently our eyeball thing is off, layer visibility. You know, you have this. You're getting to see something like that. And if you wanted to, if you really wanted to, what you could do is on this thing, because this is the thing controlling that stuff, we could add an effect. This is where effects and presets come in. I'm going to show how to use like a blur. And I'm going to use a very common blur called the Gaussian blur. Gaussian blur. And drag it not on this. Up, I mean, on the top one to be honest, but it turns up on there. Choose that. Right, probably not seeing any difference. Reason being because what we're seeing now looks like this. And that's not really changing much. Right, the other thing is that After Effects is not going to read. You can see that the changes, subtle changes, subtle, very subtle changes. Um, actually increase the size of that to get even more of a blur which will give us more of a look like that right so right so you're getting something looking more like that and if for example you say you want to have a little bit of it showing before or what if for example you have it in blue. What if you wanted to show it in white first and then have the smoke overlay in black? Wouldn't that be cool? So what I'll do is duplicate also this shadow of his wings. Control D, right? And we want this in white. Remember what we mentioned before, you have um the Luma Mac, and you also have the Luma Mac in first. What we can do is with the first one, it's going to show a uh, cool line. So, like this, but you cannot still want to see the black. We could actually do this by carrying this down, like so, perhaps, maybe about here. And that shows up like that. This is working out the way we want. Well, then you can also do this <clears throat> and do the same thing you're doing with this control D, get a copy up here. And rather than using Luma Mac, <clears throat> we use the Luma inverted, <clears throat> which means it's going to start off white. 
smoke does a thing and it becomes black. Right, so shadow of his wings. And when the smoke runs out, you know, it returns back to white, if it ever is. Or you could go as far as to say, all right, cool, that's cool. We're doing this, shadow of his wings. Smoke, 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 amazing, blah, blah, blah. And then afterwards, you decide, all right, cool. Uh, this can actually pop to me. Right, it always um, change the opacity of this. But T and C, both of them, T. So if you select both, click on one, hold control, and select the next one, and set the opacity of both of them at the same time, and just say, all right, cool. Let's just have it fade to zero. Once you're both connected, both of them will fade to zero. Right? So you could have something like this. And that would be it. Almost looks like milk, to be honest. And you could have smooth it out even further by right clicking and pressing uh, keyframe interpolation and changing that to uh, a Bezier or, you know, Something else busy or something. And you press OK. Gives you that look smoothness. All right, so we have shadow of his wings. Ta da! And it fades out. Now, let's add a little creme de la creme. We have the visuals, but we kind of still want to have also some of these. So let's say it starts off here, and put that zero, and now we kind of fade in after a couple of seconds, you know. So, okay. All right, let's put in the audio now, All right? Did we import the audio? Project? Yes, we did. Hello, uh, platform, and just put it there. Uh, so we can actually have the audio. So if you play it as is, and if you can actually hear my audio, you should be able to. Um, let's RAM preview this. You're going to probably see some stuff occurring. All right, so I'm going to press zero on my numpad. It's going to try and do that. And so one thing to note as well, while I'm doing my RAM preview, what happens is that right now I'm in full resolution, which means it's going to play as though you were rendering it. If you want to speed up your workflow, you can always choose to lower the quality while you're doing your stuff. It's relatively negligible, depending. But I mean, when you're scrubbing through, you're going to see it and it's going uh, to come back to part. And you could actually press zero to get it to do the RAM preview. And I it play out. Right. And do that stuff. I know it's actually rendering all for the music with it. Right? I'm also going to show you how to manipulate the um, audio as well. So this is like the yeah, basic intro. Thing. Then I want to show you how to do create an intro with just um, every sequence, but like just after effects things without importing stuff. That's why this was familiar to me. I've used this before. Mm. Yep. So I don't like the way that started. It feels like there's a, a pause before it starts. So if you press it again, mm. that audio, and let's say you want to hear the audio while you're tapping this. Actually, you hold control, ETRL, command if you're using a Mac, and you can join this. You begin to hear the audio somewhere about here, near one second. Now, if you're not too comfortable, like maybe there's a syncing problem, perhaps. You can actually visually check. By expanding your audio, you have audio and you have to be able to close it exactly where your audio is. And from there, if you want your audio to go um, over to the left side, you can actually just follow your ears and just do that. If I play this back, there's no need to recache because the audio is just audio. Let's play out. Now, 
what if you wanted it to kind of fade out to nothing here? Rather than actually starting up something again. But what you could do, for the time it doesn't seem bad, you can actually add audio levels to it as well. So I've just added a keyframe for my audio, and I can tell it to just go to negative 48 decibels, which is basically me telling it, hey, shut up, in a sense. So it's not going to play anymore. Audio, you can see by the waveform, does that as well. You can actually tell with how that looks as well. That you can check out. So, right, you just heard that while ago. So, I'm going to pull this back. I don't want to hear it at all. So, let's look for one more clip. I'm looking for just another one. Uh, free stock footage. Uh, I would like to get some like of a, a smoke puff, like poof. No. Something that just poof and then just disappears, you know. Something I can use with light. Smoke concept transition. That's rising smoke. No. Smoke texture. No. Let's see. Not at all. It's not fading to nothing. That's the problem. All right, regardless, what I'll do is just, we're just gonna work with what we have in After Effects. So I'm gonna create one last composition and I wanna overwhelm in one night. Uh, simple title sequence. I'm gonna create a new shape layer. I'm sorry, not shape layer. So we haven't reached shape yet. New. Solid again. This time my solid is going to be whatever color I choose. It doesn't really matter. That's okay. And for my solid, I'm going to add an effect called a ramp. Ramp is basically a gradient. New after effects is probably going to be called gradient ramp. And you can actually make it two colors. That's how ramps work with two colors. Um, I can make one color, perhaps something like that. Nice. Right. Um, ramp. And um, we're going to change that from a near ramp to a radial ramp. So actually, I actually would have preferred to have my lighter color up here. So I'm going to change that. Something like that. And this one is a bit dark. So we're getting some light. So you have a start position which you can actually manipulate, and an end position which you can actually still manipulate. We're getting that nice fat loop. Ah, sorry. New text. Again, we're using text as our block. And I'm going to add a, a different thing. I'm going to add something else with because I'm pretty sure you're getting bored now. Um, we're going to add a few effects to this. Uh, the ancient. And it's getting so right now we're at a quarter of you. So I'm going to put that to about half. So at least we get some crisper edges. Uh, and I don't mind the font. Mm, that might be a little bit too much. You can just scroll through or scrub through to see which one you like. Ancient, the ancient. This one actually doesn't look bad. But I still do like the Debas look, to be honest. Well. Let's use b -bus because, you know, b -bus just be like, yeah. The ancient, right. So there's something we're gonna be doing today, again. So we have the ancient, we're gonna be, I'm gonna be showing you how to use the, the text animator, which is where things get, start getting kind of cool. 
So I want to take this in stages, uh, piece at a time. We want all the letters to show up, but we want each letter to pop up. So it's going to be like each letter is going to be in like transparent, completely transparent, and pop up one at a time. So we're going to be um, animating the text. So here we go, text. Um, and you have option of animating. What we're going to be doing is say we want each of them to pop up from being transparent to being um, opaque, and it's moving from probably downwards, upwards, or to its current position. So I'm going to be playing with positioning first of all. And I'm also going to add a property to that, which will be, so you have to know which ones you want to be using. Uh, and right now it's doing nothing. We want to start our position a little bit lower than we have it. Uh, if we look here, we have X and we have Y value. Remember, X goes left to right, Y goes up and down. So I'm going to pull this down because I kind of want them to start here. Right, right now it's still doing nothing. And I also want to start invisible as well. So we have something like that. Again, this is still doing nothing. But we have something here called a range selector. When you select your range selector, um, it allows you to essentially play with a range. So right now it's at zero, 100, any value. So if you do this, so you're getting something like that. All right, if you start off with that, you're getting something like this. What we want is, we want, we want that. We want something more along the lines of, um, I wouldn't mind if it started off transparent or end and start like this. So we're gonna offset it from zero to 100, which means it's gonna do what it's supposed to, but we're gonna be doing it something like this. And you know what would be cool is if this was getting, it was blurry at first as well. But first of all, let's tackle the, the point that, hey, it works like this. So I'm gonna start off at zero here, which is gonna give us nothing. Uh, keyframe here, probably after about a second or so. One, one second, or about near there. Right, you can actually check right there, so if you want to. I don't really care to. And then for about mm, a fraction of a second, it's going to become like this ancient. <clears throat> and I'm also going to do one more thing. I'm going to press F9, which is a shortcut we use for toggling uh, easy ease keys. So what happens, it starts off slow, gets faster. We can actually move both at the same time or actually make it slower by increasing the spacing. The last part right there, just silly. I'm also going to change the font to something not as bright, something more like this. It's a little something you can actually see that it's being affected by something else. So the ancient is a little bit like this. Right, ancient words are true. Changing, changing, right. So we have that. The reason why I want to use a darker text is because there's another effect I want to show you. So let's say the ancient looks like this. The bam, words are popping up. And if, for example, you like the effect, but you still want to add more to it, you can actually add. For example, I might like, I don't know, there's a blur property. And perhaps I want me to start it with blurry. Because I have the blur property on, I can just add this because it's going to be following the same range. I mean, the same range selector. You can actually pull off something like this. Right, something like that. Depending on what you want to. Right, so there might be that if you want to do that. Right, you can always play with the animator itself if you want to do more. Right, you can even add a different thing to animate all together, which is also pretty cool, it gives you more control. What I want to do is just this. First off, comes on the ancient. And then, well, I'm going to just add a few properties here. So. If you've ever used Photoshop for like design or ever use the effects layer in Photoshop where you can do like drop shadows and all those things, you can actually do it here as well. So I want to right click here. I'm going to choose um, layer style, which is also available in Photoshop. And I'm going to have a little thing here, a uh, Bevenal inbox. Right, it's going to give me a few 
additional I'm gonna zoom in. I particularly hate Mevlon name box, but if you have control over it, you can actually make it many to your windows. So right now it's besides that five I'm gonna pull that down a little bit. I mean like point for this. One that might be good, right? Point five. The point size of giving a little bit from there, you know, probably point giving. I was making a different often, definitely not. Uh, opacity highlight over you can actually change that if you wish to. And you can even change how much opacity you have on the shadows as well. Might be very subtle. I can use global light, uh, I can use altitude as well as change the way it looks. You get something more of a like this. Right. Technique smooth. Inner bevel, outer bevel, emboss. Emboss doesn't look too bad. Pillow emboss. Book emboss. You don't have any strokes, so don't have any anything. I choose inner bevel. Oh no, that works for me. So I'm also going to add some, so that comes on ancient. And perhaps now that it is the way it is, it, the, the blur kind of makes you lose the kind of that blur there. Right, so you get that feel. I also want to add something. Um, uh, So we have um, not jet stream, like saying something with lights, not backgrounds here on the presets. Um, there are some things like light rays, light seek. There we go. Light seek is going on the text. Um, you can see there. So you're going to have something that looks like this. And so after that comes up, you're going to have, you get heat after about a Four seconds, you can do a light sweep. You can change the center. So one, two, and just move this over. Right. So you're probably looking at this and you're like, all right, I saw you do something a while, but I'm not seeing the keyframes. All right. So there's one more shortcut I forgot to tell you about. So in the event that you're animating and you want to see the keyframes for the things you've animated already. You can press U, that's a shortcut to view the keys that have been animated. I'm gonna highlight these again. So you close your keyframes that you have animated and you can press U again to target it again. So you'd only be able to see just the things that you're working with already. Because it looks like this, I can do that. You know, it does this wonderful little thing. And maybe I wanna add an additional effect to it. I kind of like light rays as well. Light rays allows you to do something that uh, looks a little something like this. Right, but I want this only to happen while this thing is moving at all. For example, I'll start up here. And again, for the light rays, I'm going to change the color, this color from source. That means it's going to be brown like the source. Of course, you can change that and you want it to be white like whatever it is. But it doesn't seem like it's going to be kind of you know, effective if the light sweep isn't happening at the same time. But we notice the light sweep starts about here, a matter of timing. So for example, here, and I want to set a keyframe right about here for the center trick. And as it's going across, it's kind of gauge the timing and just do your own thing as well. Right, what's going to happen, I'm pressing you, you're going to see now additional keys popping up. So I'm going to set a keyframe here, F9. When it plays out, you're getting something like that. Right, so that's kind of cool. But what if you want to let to jump at the same time by doing that whole live streak, you know, to show that little Mexican wave kind of appear? Wouldn't that be kind of neat? Maybe. 
right? So we have the text, the ancient, right? So it's going so that light it is happening, which is kind of cool, right? I imagine if I wanted it to jump again, I might actually have to add another animator, which would be the pause animator, which again allows me to change things. All right, so let's say we have that as our thing. I have a range selector for this as well. So it's going to start off perhaps at uh, zero to 100 with an offset, perhaps like this, and doing that. And perhaps you don't want to be jumping, you know, the whole thing jumping all at once. Or maybe you want, for example, just a bit of it. Perhaps zero to another hundred, but zero to perhaps I don't know something else, like something like that. Right, so we can try the offset here before the fancy light show, and in the boat there. Right, so then you have something like this. So this is where you want to really start. Oh. Right, so being that this is as is the, um, not the light sweep so much, but the um, light rays, the light rays centers are somewhere. I'm gonna split those and let's say I wanted the light rays not to be so low, but perhaps bring them up on the y-axis because you know it's going to be jumping and such. You can actually bring that up as 510 and I want to be consistent and say 510 as well. Just so it jumps along inside with Oof. I'm sorry, wait, I just realized I'm supposed to be playing with the X axis. 528. Can actually hide those as well. Um, right, so we get that. Lovely. Yes, shall we? Unreasonably quiet. I think they may have fallen asleep. Uh, so that's like you have the ancient, you don't even do a kinetic typography video. Ancient of days, the ancient of days. By the ancient, and we could call that a knight. I mean, the additional stuff we could do, I feel like this is enough, right? Um, to get what you need done. I mean, unless you want to do stuff like spotlight or light burst, which would give you something more like that. Yeah. Right, which we don't really particularly need. Right, so then fade to it. I want to remove that light burst. We have those options and we see how things work. You know? So if you want to add like the holy music and stuff, you know, we can do that. But I want to see what we have so far as a file. Save as. And I will change that to um, not projects, but multimedia, again. I would call this uh, after effects. After that, after hours. Mm. Five zero zero one. 
data. So hopefully that was uh, insightful. And one of the things I recommend is definitely practicing. If you don't practice, you won't get it. Right? And if you don't get it, then that's on you. Ah, so have yourselves a good night, gentlemen. Oh, and I'm gonna add one, just one more thing before I finish, because this effect looks cool. I'm gonna add a new, and I'm not even going to add a new solid because we have enough black solids to go around. A single type of sequence project. A solid, we have a black one here. I'm gonna chop that on top of everything. And we're gonna add something called lens layer. So lens layer is pretty useful. Right? Right now it's a lens layer with, it's basically covering everything. So the blending mode we'll use and the blending mode that makes dark colors turn to nothing is a screen blending mode, which essentially looks like this. So in the event that you want to do something like, like so, that's a Z ancient. And um, for example, if you want to be behind this, which I would never recommend, this as well. Because the lens pair has different types of types, um, different lens types. You have the prime and you have the one oh five millimeter prime and whichever one tickles your fancy, you know, you can always do that. So then you get something looking kind of like this. So for example, if it's going across, you know, bam, and then you have the amazing that, why not go all out with the lights, right? So for example, I might start off here in terms of clear brightness being zero. And then we're going to animate the flare brightness for one. We're also going to animate the flare center. And just as this is about to start off, we're going to fling that about here. And you're going to increase the flare brightness to whatever amount you want to. Right? Let's just blend with original. You can do that if you want to. Right? You know, a good 77% flare. You know, whether you want to be light enough or not. So I'm going to leave mine about 20%. Um, and we're going to animate again. F9, two things. And again, also looking at the change in the one here, we're going to carry it across because you want that um, movement of the. Um, the flare center on the x axis is going to cross like so. Right, and after it reaches about here for that, don't forget that, you know, that looks beautiful. You also want to make sure that you're keeping the same intensity across. So, we want to set a keyframe there. And as you begin to fade out, so for example, you continue moving on the x axis you're going to have this thing become zero. So then your ancient title text will be something like this. Right, and you can add additional effects, um, like so. For example, uh, the music we have probably doesn't fit in quite well. Maybe we might need some um, sound effects, like video game sound effects work. For things that it's like, I remember using RPG Maker XP back in the day. Right? Oh, and, that's an OG right there. And they had so many different sound effects you could just use for other things. So, um, holy sound effects. Right? See if there's any places that holy sound effects for plugging. Any other websites you can probably get a sound effect. Uh, imagining that's going to cost me something, so I'm going to take some stuff. God kind of thing, what dry? That's not. Guessing these don't work. Mm 
insert coin plus. These are all the holy sound effects I have. What about music? Holy choir dance. No, I don't want any tidbits on fish bells. I want sounds. I don't think I don't think I'm gonna find um the sound on this. Here we go, heavenly choir sound effects. And we're work, never mind. This is very common, isn't it? There we go. That that works. Can I get this song? All right, lovely. Soundboard you have helped. So download complete spring folder. Of course, you know. I might want to drop this inside the same project folder with everything that we're doing so far. I'm not going to do that because I'm and the sound effect is about four seconds long. I'm assuming and after effects is crashing. So hmm. There we go. Lovely. Heavenly coil. Uh sample title sequence. Uh we have well, oops, caps lock is on, so make sure that's off. And it's still off. So hold on. All right, so here we go. Wonderful. Uh, where do we imagine the phone to be? Uh, probably starting off here. Probably a little bit here. Or mayhaps it starts off here. Let's play it over and see. Let's, let's do. What is that? Play it properly. That's way too fast. Is that really how fast it is? Wow, that's fast. Right, so if the timing is off, of course, you have to go back inside each of these keyframes. Bam, see how we have a smiley face thing with, never mind. And do that. I actually thought this was a lot slower. I mean, spacing out the keyframes shouldn't be an issue so much. Um, just a matter of tweaking. You know, four seconds is actually pretty short. Especially here. Here is perhaps the arguably longest and shortest point. May have second to do this. You know, as those are all the keyframes, right? And I don't like the way this ends so abruptly. So you know, Mongo, I am going to this thing. Where's the thing that tells you that the light, the clear brightness, we can actually stop the clear brightness from being that bright after a bit here. So for example, it goes up to here. In fact, moving it is probably not even an, shouldn't have even been an issue. Um, X value, just shrink it, you know, from here. All right, perhaps it is an issue. Hmm. Positioning wise, maybe.
That's rather fast, don't you think? Right, there we are. Something kind of like that. Not bad to do like that. But, I mean, lesson learned. Right. That's what we need is continual movement and fading. There we are, much better. And yeah, that's it. Hopefully, well, let's see with the music as well. It needs to fade out. Um, so we expand that, change the audio, change the waveform or change the levels and kind of have it fade out from here to about here. And just fade it out with F9. Let's play it back and see what happens and probably even at the beginning, perhaps uh, start off right on, put that at zero. I put this also at zero by dropping a keyframe. But I might go back to the first one by clicking on the time indicator going back, holding shift, making sure that the keyframe is selected and setting that to zero so it doesn't make a sound before it starts. And then you have something like that. Right, that's, that's, that works. So hopefully that helps. Um, that's what we're doing today. So, I mean, yeah. And we're actually at the two hour mark, nice. So make sure you do your homework, replicate this, do this over again. Uh, and if you don't, we just won't have any more classes. Mm. Okay, so uh, Sam, whenever I see you again, I give you new Thing just remember to remind me to give you a thing. Uh, no, please. Oh, I actually want to learn this. Yeah, that was pretty. That was, that was pretty cool and stuff.